Subtle in class, today we're covering the fighter, the- well, I know I always do these little descriptions, but is it really necessary this time? I mean, it's in the name. Person what does that fighting thing. It used to literally be called fighting man. Oh, I know, I could spice it up with some cosplay. No, you're good. You sure? You're taking up too much screen. Fine. Honestly, they don't really need the help. Everyone mocks them for being basic, but they have plenty of exciting subtypes to spice things up. Samurai, mage knight, giantkin, psychic warrior. If you're looking for something with armor and a weapon, you can probably find a good fit. So let's hop to it. You ready? Let's go! As far as the stats go, they're about what you'd expect. Second highest hit die with a D10, good with strength and constitution, and they can use all armor and weaponry. And that's a trend you'll notice. The fighter is a generalist warrior with options for specialization. They get an extra action once per short rest at level 4, and twice at level 17. At level 5, you can attack twice per action, three times at level 11, and four at level 20. At level 9, you can re-roll a saving throw once per long rest, or twice at 13, and three times at 17. Basic as a brick, but just as useful. Though your one bit of class specialization is chosen right at the beginning. Level 1, Fighting Style. Archery, dueling, and throwing weapon style will give you more accuracy with a weapon, while unarmed, two weapon, and great weapon will give you more damage. We got defense for more AC, interception to reduce damage on a friend, and protection to help them avoid the attack altogether. Your odd ones out are blind fighting to fight in the dark and foil invisible creatures, and superior technique to get a maneuver and die from the Battlemaster. The Battlemaster being one of the fighter's subclasses, known as archetypes. These are specializations, granting them more power at level 3, 7, 10, 15, and 18. Between that and the bonus feats, they really can get a lot. So let's dive in. Battlemasters are fighters that decided they weren't generalist enough and spread their base even further. They study from many masters, learn from many fields, and now have all sorts of tricks to bring down their foe. These tricks are called maneuvers, used by expending your four superiority die, a set of d8s that you get back on a short rest. As you level, these dice will grow in size and number, capping out at 6d12. But what are these tricks? Well, pretty much anything mundane you can think of. Increasing damage or accuracy, tripping, parrying. I'm not gonna list all 23, they're on the board. You start with three, eventually learn up to nine, and honestly, you'll want most of them. Which is good, because that's about all that you're gonna be able to do. I mean, eventually you can stare at something for a full minute to find out their HP or level or something, and at level 15, you get one superiority dice if you start combat while empty, but those aren't really the most impactful things. But that doesn't really matter, because the amount of maneuvers you get really make up for it. You basically get to build your own fighter here, especially if you double down with that superior technique fighting style. And speaking of that build your own fighter concept, this is exactly why the fighter is not the boring stereotype everyone paints it out to be. They're a blank canvas, and you have the brush. If the character is dull, my sister and Saren Ray, you built the character. Why are they fighting? How are they fighting? Are they using a family weapon or anything that they can find? Are they a former town guard? Why former? Were they fired or lost the town or couldn't stand the corruption? Maybe they just thought this adventuring business should be done by someone who actually cares about the surrounding area. And who is the person underneath all that armor? Because a character is more than a job, and if they aren't, lean into it. Make a fighter who's a general maintenance worker or janitor. They take that act and do pretty much anything that needs doing mindset and bring it into their fighting. No a trick or having a tool for pretty much anything. Might not be pretty, but it'll work. And you move to fighting monsters because somebody has to. Being knee-deep in monster guts isn't glamorous, but someone's got to do it to keep this place running. Look, I know I got a thing for making adventures into blue-collared workers, but that and customer service are just kind of what I know. And speaking of sticking to what you know, they definitely lean more on the media stereotype for the samurai. Still, I gotta admit they're pretty cool, blending courtly nobility alongside their fighting. They get an extra language or proficiency in history, insight, performance, or persuasion. I would double down into persuasion, as level 7 lets them add their wisdom modifier to persuasion checks, and they get proficiency in wisdom saving throws. On the actual fighting side, three times per day they get a temporary tiny heal and advantage on attack rolls. At level 10 they get one of those uses back at the start of combat if they're out, and at level 15 they can trade advantage on an attack for another extra attack once per round. And once a day at level 18 when you hit 0 HP, you interrupt the current turn to take your own full turn before you fall unconscious, which is wonderful. The player for persuasion makes it work well for any militant nobility, but honestly they kinda seem more like an anime protagonist to me. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, I'm just saying that flurries of attacks while fighting on through determination and making persuasion checks does seem pretty anime. You can also start stepping on other classes' toes. Maybe you're the arbiter for a god of redemption, a villain's last chance. You try to talk them down, but will fight to the bitter end if projected. Or be an armored barbarian just too angry to die. This class works really well with anyone who'd take a knife to the gut and say, you're gonna have to try a little harder than that. Of course, with all that said, people tend to only pick this if they specifically want a samurai. If you do go that route, then pick a clear concept like Orcish Ronin, or a noble protector of a particular person, and commit to the bit to make it crystal clear. It's a pretty nice class, and you can do a lot with it. Though to be honest, if I wanted to make an actual samurai, this wouldn't be my first pick. But we'll get to that one later. For now, it's Eldric Nighttime. These decided to add some magic into the mix, spread that diversity into the arcane. You start just knowing three first level spells, but eventually learn 13 with spell slots up to level 4. Most of them have to be abjuration or evocation, but those are the protect yourself and hurt people domains, so you are probably already going in that direction. You can also summon your weapon to your hand 
hand as a bonus action and cannot be disarmed while conscious. Not gonna come up every campaign, but it's pretty great for swapping weapons on the fly or sneaking them where they shouldn't be. And despite the common misconception, when going gets rough, you can use an action surge to cast two spells in one turn or attack with your weapon and a spell at the same time. It's great to have so many options, but starting at level 7, you don't have to choose. You can attack with your weapon as a bonus action whenever you cast a cantrip. At level 10, hitting someone with your weapon gives them disadvantage when trying to resist your spell's save. And at level 15, you can teleport whenever you action surge. You can do it after or even between the actions, so if you beat one creature, you can warp to the next and keep going. Now let's get the elephant out of the room. This was one of the original two builds people tried to use to toss a coin to the Witcher, or their Skyrim character, or any of the other spell sword tropes. The base concept is someone who picked up a couple of spells they could commit to memory because magic is useful on the battlefield. It works well for anyone in a fighting profession, but they offer you a twist of going in reverse. Maybe you wanted to be a wizard, but your mentor was killed, so you switched to fighting while studying on the side. Or maybe you're inherently magical like a sorcerer, but don't really care and just want to hit stuff. Or maybe you're an enthusiast. You're not formally trained and have to fight as a day job, but you're just really into magical theory in your off time. It's just super neat. Or maybe you really are trying to learn magic, but you have a short attention span and just default to weapons because you can't focus. Give yourself a spell book and say you spend an hour studying it like a wizard, but you only end up learning three spells because you just keep getting distracted. Spell swords are pretty common. Inspiration is pretty much anywhere there's magic. Although Eldritch Knights aren't the only one with magic and weaponry, and some fighters don't keep them separate. Arcane archers are, well, the name kinda says it all. Seriously, they only have like three abilities. At level seven, they can use their bonus action to direct a missed attack towards a new target. At level three, they get a cantrip that does your laundry and a selection of magical arrows. You get to pick two out of the eight options and use them twice per short rest. So at level 15, you do regain one use when combat starts if you're completely out. Every other level up is getting one more option available until you eventually have six out of eight. They're all based on different spell schools with a little extra damage and an effect like homing in on people or slowing them down. You really do have a lot of fun arrow options here. And for most options, you don't have to choose whether you activate the magic arrow until after it hits. And what even are these arrows? Maybe your quiver is made with a height of monsters, imbuing them with their traits. Or the heads are covered in runes, activating in a whispered word of power. Or maybe they're just a magically conductive crystal, letting you cast your normally weak magic directly into the opponent's body. Also, how did you even get this power? The original arcing archers learned from nature spirits, but maybe you're cosplaying as a cleric and Artemis imbues you with power when you call her name. Or you could just go full artificer and coat your arrows with thermite. Though I gotta admit, I really wish you got to use it more. It's acting like five of your abilities, but you'll see it like three times a day. Unless you're level 15 and survey says you probably aren't. At least the arrow redirection is pretty cool, and your arrows do count as magic so you can still shoot a ghost. But as cool as magic weaponry is, the fighters got a lot more than that. The rune knight carves giant magic into everything they have. I mean, the magic is coming from giants. It's why you know the giant language and have smithing tools. I'm not sure the magic itself is especially big. You start out knowing two runes and eventually learn five out of six, because fighters just love leaving you so close to completion. When you're carrying or wearing an item with a rune carved into it, they give you a variety of powers, like how the hill giant rune gives you advantage on saves to be poisoned, resistance to poison damage, and once for short rest lets you resist all bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage for one minute. Each rune can be activated once per short rest. Moving on to level 7, I lied, we're not even done with 3 yet. You can also activate giant mode, where you get advantage on strength checks and saves, do an extra d6 of damage once per turn, and become large. You can do this your proficiency modifier in times per day. Now at level 7 for real, you can force any attack made within 60 feet to reroll. Once again, your proficiency times per day. At level 10, you grow a little and do more damage in giant mode. At 15, you can invoke your rune powers twice. And at 18, you grow huge when in giant mode. Being huge lets you move faster and deal a d10 of damage. This is the sort of magic items I like. The runes give you passive effects alongside your active ones. And when you get new runes, you still get other abilities as well. This is great, though a little bit limiting in ways you can twist it. My first idea is to tie the runes to other things. Make them invoke dragons or elementals or gods. Maybe these are the true names of demons or fae, and they lend you strength when you invoke their name. And how did you even learn these runes? Did you win them in a game of dice or study an abandoned city? Or maybe your ancestors saved a giant who taught them power as thanks, and your family has passed this secret down for centuries. But what if your magic isn't actually magic? You just tap into an invisible force to shield you or attack people or cast telekinesis. More specifically, the Psy Warrior has a pool of d6s as energy. You can reduce the damage someone takes, lift things, deal extra force damage, or draw a tiny object to your hand, all with a range of 30 feet. At level 7, you can also fly for a round, and your psychic strike pushes people. At 15, you can shield yourself and your allies with half cover. First time for long rest is free, just like your level 18 telekinesis. It's the normal spell without components, so you can make an extra attack as a bonus action while you're concentrating. Oh, and at level 10, you're resistant to psychic damage and can remove the frightened or charmed conditions with the power of your brain. What a powerful force, or just any old force. This is a Jedi. Let's just get that out of the way. Snap on some pull plate and throw people around, maybe adding in a menacing maneuver or great weapon fighting. But just like the samurai, it can be more than that. The 
atrophied old master mooping their body through mental might, or a bulky brute with a club that preys on people who underestimate his wit. You could be the experiment of a mind player or a wizard, or just reflavor your powers as magic and be some sort of sorcerer version of the war wizard. And I know everyone goes longsword, but what weapon you use isn't specified, just that your target is within 30 feet. Be a true hero with spears, or an archer launching people to remove their cover. And if your GM allows them, be a psychic with a shotgun. Anyway, we're starting to get a little silly with all this mystical power and things calling themselves a knight when they don't even have a mount. Let's see, uh, there's purple dragon knight. Oh boy. Whenever you use your second wind feature to heal, you can add three other creatures per your level in HP. At level 7, you gain double proficiency in persuasion, and at 10, your action surge lets another ally make an attack as a reaction, or two allies at level 18. And at 15, you can let an ally re-roll a saving throw whenever you use your indomitable feature on wisdom, intelligence, or charisma saving throws. Or in much shorter terms, you're letting others take a fraction of your feature whenever you choose to use them. It's thematically kinda neat, and you know I value theming highly, but... Eh, you're not really getting anything new, and it only helps your allies if they're close and also need that thing at the same time. At least you can twist the abilities well. Maybe you're giving a power of friendship speech to inspire those around you, or your menacing aura intimidates others into continuing the fight. Your determination could be billowing off you in a wave of magical power. And speaking of magic, maybe you're using time magic, letting other people take an extra shot at their save, or undoing the damage they took. Or you could go the druidic route, hijacking your allies' survival instincts to get those extra swings and saves. And that's even without through Wait, they don't get a mount? What kind of Mandela effect is this? I could have swore they rode a baby dragon. Where are the horses? Right, the cavalier. Now that is a knight. You can hop on or off your mount for five feet of movement. It's hard to knock you off, and you even land on your feet if the fall's ten feet or less. You can also mark a creature that you hit, giving them disadvantage if they're within five feet and attack anyone other than you. And regardless of their distance, if they hurt someone else, you can attack them with advantage and half your level and extra damage as a bonus action on your next turn. You can only do the attack part a few times a day, but you can always mark people for disadvantage. Helps keep damage off your allies and mount. Just like your level 7 ability, where you add a d8 to the AC of an ally within 5 feet. And if the attack hits anyway, you give the person resistance, shaving off half the damage. At level 10, you can make an opportunity attack on anyone who moves while within your reach as a reaction, stopping them from moving if it lands. And at level 18, you're allowed to take an opportunity attack every turn. Nothing's getting around you. Oh, and when you do move at level 15, you can knock an enemy prone, so they can't even escape. Now that is a mounted warrior. And I know that you're thinking how you can't take a horse into a dungeon, but the only ability requiring a mount is the one that lets you hop on your mount. You can use the rest whenever. This is an amazing defender. So for flavor, why? Why are you so obsessed with people only attacking you? Do you just love your friends so much you can't stand to see them hurt? Or is it blinding self-importance and how dare they think you aren't the biggest threat? Maybe you're looking for a good death in battle and everyone else can wait their turn. Or maybe it's just masochism. This is also a great place to lean into your species. Are you a little gnome riding a dog or a centaur acting as their own mount? Or maybe you're on foot as an angry little goblin or kobold, taking out the kneecaps of anyone who underestimates them. Oh, and I don't know if this is a hot take or a cold take. If you take the archery fighting style, you're a more accurate samurai than the samurai. They were armored mounted archers that could definitely rip you apart at close range, but preferred harassing you from horseback. Anyway, it's good to finally have a classic knight, but let's get back to basics. And note that basic does not mean bad. The champion is essentially fighter plus. You already hit hard and often, and now you score a crit on a 20 or 19, and later 18 as well. You're already good at most things physical, but at level 7 you can add half your proficiency to strength, dex, and con checks if you didn't already. You like those fighting styles? Have another. And I know you can already heal as an action, but at level 18 you start automatically healing if you're below half health. You're a fighter without anything else to worry about. No psychic powers or fancy tricks, just a person who fights well, simple and clean. And here's where I kick back a little against what I said before. The framework of person with weapon leaves the fighter feeling free, endless possibilities. But you know what? There's nothing wrong with just basic. I love spicing things up, but your staples are there for a reason. This is your basic hero, your generic protagonist, or even just yourself with a stick. You can play it straight and I'm not gonna shame you because honestly that can shake things up the most. And you can always add on over time. Give yourself room to grow. Can I share a story? My favorite champion fighter is a man named Dave. He's a human in basic, ragged gear, already old enough to start fading into folk legend. He's covered in scars and weary determination, always seeming to show up just in the nick of time. But before your monster's body starts, 
stops twitching, he's already dragging himself away. Nothing but a sigh and a call for vigilance. He's a hero, a real one, driving out darkness not for country or creed, but because he must, like he needs to breathe. Age is making both of those start to weigh on him. He understands the futility of his task, yet axe in hand, he still trudges into the night. For as long as darkness haunts the world, so will he. Or so the legend goes. I could embellish, but he's just a generic, pure-hearted fantasy hero that got old but never stopped being himself. He's not jaded or weary from the world, just determined and weary from his joints. While for me, that's a refreshing break from the bazaar, for others, he's a favorite to play repeatedly and slowly improve on. Maybe your table's Dave is called Maria or Ali. I hope you'll treat them with kindness, because we all play for different reasons. Standard and safe might just be what that player needs. And speaking of kindness, it's end of video time, so press the buttons below and let me know what sort of fighters you like with a comment. I'd like to thank Barrel Goblin and Sergeant Daniels for their constant support. If you'd like to leave a tip too and help me work towards a new microphone, link to my copy in the description below. Every dollar counts. Class dismissed.